Thanksgiving weekend, and Beaver Stadium hosts a game with stakes. Well, I'll tell you what, is it going to be eight in a row for the Nittany Lions? We'll find out soon enough. And we'd like to be unpredictable, right? Uh, Penn State may have a game next week. We may have a show next week. We'll see. <laughs> All we know is we're here now, and the Blue White Tailgate is next. <laughs> Welcome to the Blue Eye Tailgate, Steve, Trey, Todd. We hope you're enjoying your Thanksgiving weekend, and we get to this weekend, and Penn State plays a big game after dominating Rutgers in every phase of the game. I mean, it wasn't even close. We talked about it last week. I said that, uh, you know, I thought Penn State would win by 50. I was just saying to Todd that, you know, <laughs> other than the four field goals, if there were, you know, if two other possessions, we would have scored 50. Rutgers could be the worst Big Ten team in the last 25 years. They got their work cut out for us, but for them. But, uh, you know, Penn State definitely dominated the game. Yeah, time. that was not a good football club no. that they lined up against. But, no. guys, I, I want to say right off the top, when is James Franklin and his staff going to start getting some national attention? Did we not dominate in the coaching phase as well? I mean, the accelerated ascent to the top of the division and the conference in just his third year, first year with full scholarships, not getting enough love out there nationally right now for a 9-2 ball club that is seventh in the country. You know what? They just want to win this week. That's what they want to do, Michigan win this State, week. Michigan State, Michigan State, Michigan yeah. State. Well said, Trey. <laughs> well said. Nice to see you on board with it. All right. Coming up on the show, we'll take a look at Penn State, Michigan State. We'll go to the film room not once, huh? but it's Thanksgiving. We're going there twice. All right. So let's get to the update desk in Mandy Nyad. Thanks, Steve. I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving and got to spend it with family somewhere in America. I'm ready for Christmas. Now let's take a look at the Health South Injury Update Board. We've got 99 problems and Von Walker is one of them. His season and career at Penn State has come to an end following a knee injury last Saturday. If you were ever wondering what your favorite college football coach listens to on his iPod, then today is your lucky day. Here's the blueprint for the Big Ten coaches' favorite musical artists. The top vote-getters among all 128 coaches were Kenny Chesney, the Eagles, and George Strait with five votes apiece. For the full list, maybe to see what Charlie Strong will be listening to once he's fired, check my Twitter. And if you caught my Jay-Z references, coach, that was for you. Back to you guys. All right. Thank you, Mandy. All right. Let's get to the drive of the game. And uh, the drive of the game is brought to you by our great friends at Stocker Chevrolet, located on the Better Pike across from the Nittany Mall. The longest drive of the season for Penn State to this point had been 90 yards, but this ends up being a 12-play, 95-yard drive that gets rolling with Trace McSorley. And again, guys, what McSorley's done with his feet has made such an incredible difference. Well, I think the difference is, I mean, that's clearly what we did not have last year with Christian. Obviously, Christian was a very, very talented thrower, but he's certainly not the runner that traces. Both on third downs, just to keep those drive, the drive going, guys. Those third down conversions kill. And no Barkley, no problem. We'll just put Miles Sanders in the game. <laughs> and then, oh, okay, now we'll put Mark Allen in the game. Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, the fact is they're just reloading that running back and, uh, you know, talk about having depth. I mean, when you have your third-string tailback, it was the number one recruit in the country at running back last year. That's pretty good. Steve, you see the numbers, 12 plays, 95 yards over five minutes, almost six minutes. They held the ball in the fourth quarter for, almost, for over 10 minutes, almost 19 minutes yeah. overall in the second half. Uh, the defense was pretty fresh at the end of this game. Yeah. That is our drive of the game, brought to you by our good friends at Stocker Chevrolet, located across from the Nittany Mall on the Benner Pike, which brings us now to our family clothesline offensive players of the week, and it's that offensive line. We talked about all of the running backs doing their job. It all starts with the big guys in the trenches. Yeah, I mean, if you would have said to me that, you know, at one point during this year that the offensive line is going to be the player of the game, I would say you're crazy. <laughs> the fact is the kids have played well. You know, they kind of stuck to it. They've been reloading. They, they've had injuries. But uh, the fact is, you know, it's the next man up, and, and they've done a wonderful job. They sure have, and they end up being our family clothesline offensive players of the week for the great job that they did up front. 
as we watch this, we know what the scenarios are going to be coming up for the weekend. It's quite simple. Ohio State wins, Penn State wins, Penn State goes. Michigan wins, they go. If obviously Ohio State wins and Michigan State wins, Ohio State goes. Those are the scenarios. All right, opening statement presented by the law offices of Alan Kirk. Saquon Barkley, will you watch the scoreboard, my man? No, but it's 2016 media. You can see the scoreboards and everything. You're going to be a little aware, but I feel like as a team, we can't focus in on that. Uh, we only can control what we can control, and that's Michigan State uh, right now. And um, if it's meant for us, then the rest will take care of itself. Saquon Barkley. All right, we go from offense to defense, and our defensive player of the week is Brandon Bell. Goes back to Jersey. All Jersey starting linebackers for Penn State. This is brought to you by the family clothesline. Bell has been, his return to the lineup has been a stabilizer. Absolutely. I mean, the fact is that, you know, when he was out, um, Penn State was really, really struggling. He comes back. You know, he, he's, he, I think he's our best defensive player. Um, he's legit. He's a leader. You know, he's got wheels. He makes tackles. He's, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he's going to be the next great Penn State linebacker, he in my opinion. great instincts. Well, everybody yeah. talks about being a playmaker as well. And how many times do we see B-Bell around the ball and it's fallen out of the quarterback's hands? There's a strip sack. There's something happening that's not just the tackle. There's something in addition to it. Michigan State is where we're going to go next. We'll talk about them and also go to the film room as we continue on Blue White Tailgate after this. All right, so there's a look at the Penn State offense. They get ready for Michigan State and that Michigan State defense. Let's take a look at the numbers, the comparison side-by-side side between the two as to where Penn State's gone and where the Michigan State defense has gone this year. And, uh, you know, Michigan State, I thought, played Ohio State. I thought really tough last week. I thought they played Michigan really tough as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me like they play up to their competition or down to their competition, and that's why they're, whatever, 3-8. and eight. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's like this is not going to be an easy game for Penn State. Penn State's going to more than have their hands full, and, um, you know, we'll see what happens on Saturday. Time. These are the defending Big Ten champions. Yeah. These guys have won a lot of football games, and they're going to – look, yeah. their pride is really going to be tested in this game, right? You're talking about a holiday weekend. They're on the road. It's, their senior day is over. So I, I think this is a really a, a pride game for Michigan State to find out what kind of leadership they have. And 3-8 and eight season, so far it hasn't looked good for their leaders, and I know they've suffered a lot of injuries. But these are the kind of things that as a young person, as a, you know, a teenager or 20-year-old, whatever, really test you what kind of game they're going to bring to Beaver Stadium. That's what really I'm intrigued about the most. Yeah. You mentioned one of those injuries is Malik McDowell, outstanding defensive tackle. He hasn't played the last couple of games against Rutgers or Ohio State with that ankle injury, and we don't know what his status is for Saturday's game as well. Saquon Barkley says when you go against Michigan State, you have to be prepared right away for the blitz. One thing that I really notice uh, with their blitz schemes, uh, how their linebackers attack their back. Um, they're really physical. A uh, good way to describe them would be like pitch backs, um, linebackers. Uh, they're really physical and aggressive, and um, uh, they have some wiggle, but their go to move would be a bull rush. And um, we, as a running back, you've got to be aware of that. Um, got to get low, got to sink your hips, and be ready to be physical and punch those guys. In the last three games, they've blitzed on uh, first and second down about 30% of the time, but on third down, they blitz about 60% of the time. Riley Buller leads the way at middle linebacker. Good secondary time. Yeah, absolutely. Demetrius Cox, a good player. And we mentioned the blitzes, Trey. And so when they're blitzing that much on third down, what does it do for the linebackers that aren't coming in and for the secondary? We know the Spartans usually always have a good secondary. Yeah, I mean, the fact is that you have to be aware of that. Um, you know, obviously in this day and age with all the, all the tape and all the film that they can watch, um, you know, they have to be prepared. And, uh, you know, certainly they've got nothing to lose coming to Beaver Stadium. Okay, so we'll be able to look at the Michigan State defense at this point. Jay Paterno is going to break it down in the film room, tell us where we're right and where we're wrong. All right, Jay, go ahead. Tell us, where are we right and where are we wrong? Thanks, Steve, and welcome into the film room brought to you by Letterman, Sports Grill, and Gastropub. Now, I know injuries don't help, but why is this Michigan State defense so inconsistent? 
Well, the big thing is where the injuries occurred. Michigan State's scheme is, is really predicated on dominating in the secondary, and they've started nine different combinations in the secondary this year. But the last four weeks, let's take a look at this first graphic. They've kind of gotten their feet back under them. You look at their numbers, they're w much better against the run, much better against the pass, and much better total defense. And that could be a problem Saturday if they bring that kind of level of play into Beaver Stadium. Now, let's take a look at a couple of things Penn State can take advantage of. Michigan State likes to play the inside three with their linebackers. Those are good matchups for Penn State with guys like Gasicki and Godwin and Barkley in the, in the core of the pass game. Here's a spread set against Michigan. Take a look at how this wideout works against this linebacker. We'll take a look at the video. He's able to kind of get isolated. Nice, easy throw. If those are the things that Penn State gets done, it'll give McSorley some easy throws to get his completion numbers up and percentage up early in the game. One formation that's good against them is trips. Because when they get in the trips, it forces them to do one thing, either keep the corner backside or bring him over. Here against Michigan, they have the corner backside against a tight end. It allows this wideout to work against the middle linebacker. And, and that could be Gasicki again. That could be a guy like Barkley. It could be a guy like Godwin. Take a look at how Michigan takes advantage of that. When Bullock is a, is a really good linebacker, but not as good against the pass, they get him isolated. They get him there, and they get a big play. Last week in the red zone, Penn State struggled in the first half. Four trips, only three field goals. One of the things they're going to do is want to spread them out because that's what Penn State does. Here, you get into a trips. They go three over two here. Safety's here to, to fill and also help on that. So Penn State's going to have to run the ball against these six guys in the box in the red zone to have some success. Take a look at how they play Michigan here in the red zone. They do a nice job here. And they gave Michigan some problems in the red zone as well. But Penn State's going to have to be able to run the football in the red zone. Last thing, but last thing we'll talk about is Michigan State is a pretty base defense. But when they get into trouble, they start to blitz. Second half against Michigan, they did some good job in the blitz, forced some bad plays. Take a look here and to see how this one works. They bring the blitz. They get pressure. They force Michigan's quarterback into a throw, change the coverage, and they make a big play. And they turn, turn the game around got them back in it uh, against Michigan. When we come back, we'll talk Penn State defense versus Michigan State offense. Stay with us. The Penn State defense last Saturday night gave up 87 yards and five first downs. That's it. It was a Trey Bauer-esque performance. <laughs> Time now for our hit of the week. Hit of the week happens early in the game. After Penn State fumbles the opening kickoff, Malik Golden makes the early statement. Yep. I mean, the fact is, you know, he's in good position there. You know, he brought his feet. There was no doubt he was taking him down. And, uh, you know, super play by him. Yeah, everybody worried about yeah. that initial fumble on the opening kickoff. It was like, ah, we got this yeah. immediately. <laughs> they run a jet sweep to Hicks. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No All problem. right, over here. Okay, two quarterbacks, Tyler O'Connor and Damian Terry. Terry's been more of a runner, O'Connor the thrower. Your thoughts on the two quarterback system? Well, I think the two quarterback system is it's kind of almost like outdated. I mean, in this day and age, I mean, you got to go with one guy. I mean, we had talked about this, you know, beginning of the season, Todd, where it was like it's going to be, you know, McSorley um, and uh, Tommy and Tommy Stevens, right? And it's like it was clear to me, like when I went to practice in the preseason, that Trace McSorley was the guy. You got to hand the reins to him, and you got to let him. You, you can't do the two quarterback thing. I, I just don't. I don't agree with it. At all. And it also depends on the talent that you have. If you have two really good quarterbacks, I don't know. It's been proven successful at times. At yeah. times. In this instance, you might have one plus one equals zero. I'm not sure either one of these guys <laughs> is the guy they want to go with long term. I mean, you got O'Connor, who's more of a stationary target, and Terry, who's the runner. In my opinion, if they're going to have any success in this game, they're, Terry's going to have to have the game of a lifetime against Penn yeah. State's defense. Well, running the football has been critical for them. And for the last five games, Michigan State has been able as a team to crack 200 yards rushing, led by L.J. Scott. Big concern for James Franklin. Your D-line is going to have to challenge their O-line at the point of attack. We can't get knocked back, which we got knocked back last year. Um, and then, and then we got to be able to, you know, get the running back on the ground. He's a big, strong back who can make you miss, can run for power. Um, you know, him and Saquon, I think, in, in some ways, have some similarities. So uh, that's going to be a real challenge for us. They've used three running backs this year: Scott, Madre, London, and Holmes. Scott and Holmes have been the primary two. Now they're not messing around anymore. They're telling you L.J. Scott's the starter. 
He's running really well right now. Yeah, I mean, he's legit. He's yeah. running downhill. He's a big, strong kid. Um, you know, he's, it's almost like he's kind of like got his feet underneath him, meaning like the first half of the season he was kind of struggling, and all of a sudden now he's got a lot of confidence. The offensive line has confidence in him, Todd. And, uh, you know, I mean, he, he's a good player. A couple of staples in the Michigan State yeah. system under D'Antonio. Good secondary yeah. and a big old running back that can pound you for 20, 30 carries a game. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so now we've talked about the principles. Let's go to the film room. Jay, what does the tape tell us about Michigan State? Welcome back to the film room brought to you by Letterman, Sports Grill, and Gastro Pub. Now, instability is the name of the game today. Carries over to offense, huh? Absolutely. And Michigan State likes to run the football. They rely on their offensive line. And this year they've started seven combinations of offensive line and probably another one this week because they had another injury. So let's talk a little bit about them more specifically. Much like the defense, the last four games, Michigan State's run game has gotten much, much better. They're 216 yards a game, and the guy that's really sparked that is L.J. Scott, both in the run game and the pass game, and we'll talk about that. Now, take a look here. at One of the things that Michigan State does that gives people problems is motion. They motion roughly two-thirds of the times uh, when, they're, when they're on offense. And here, just one guy motioned across and back to where he started. You'll see five different guys from Michigan make adjustments. So take a look at the video on this one, and you see all those adjustments. Now, when you look at the teams Penn State's really had problems with on defense, Michigan and Pitt were two of them. Lots of motions, lots of changes, strengths of formations. It gets people out of position. They can't sit there and key on certain things, so look for that on Saturday to be a potential issue. The other thing they do is they get Scott involved in the run game. They, again, here's motion again. They bring this motion around. They hand the ball to Scott. Take a look again. Michigan's making adjustments on defense as the ball snapped. Next thing you know, Scott's got the ball going the other way and getting a big play inside the 10-yard line. Now, same motion, same set. Now, here's a shot from the end zone. You're going to see them fake the ball to Scott, give the ball on the, on, to R.J. Shelton on the end around. And, again, it gets the linebackers running. Take a look again here at how this affects. Same formation, same set. Fake the ball to Scott. Now they give it to Shelton on the end around. Linebackers chasing the run game. And, again, they get the motion, get people out of position and out of, out of, out of alignment, and they can't just sit there and lock in on their keys. Scott, again, we talked about in the run game. Now take a look at the pass game. Here, you don't get any motion, but you get man-to-man -man against this man-to-man -man coverage, which Penn State does like to play. They get Scott one-on-one -on -one with the linebacker. Very simple route. Comes in, makes one little move on him, gets away from him, and makes a play. And take a look at this in the video as well. Again, the last four games, 35 yards a game in the pass game from Scott. 116, 117 in the run game. So he's going to be a big key on Saturday, how Penn State handles him. Sounds good. We'll have to keep our eye on it. There's more blue-white tailgate coming up. Stay with us. the Blue Band. And by the way, senior day for them coming up, too. Their last performance in Beaver Stadium for the Penn State Blue Band seniors and the cheerleaders and the dance team. We get to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. This time, I get to be the good. This season, seven wins in a row looking for eight. That is the good. The bad is the Rutgers season. Not good. You know, against Michigan State, Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State, 224 to nothing. Nada, zip, zilch, not a point against those four teams. That's not good. That's bad. That is bad. But it's not as ugly as what I'm going to say, which is really <laughs> upsetting to me. The fact is, so I did not travel to Piscataway to watch the game. I was, I was watching the game on TV. Literally halfway through the fourth quarter, the stadium was empty. I mean, give me a break. First of all, Rutgers has got a new coach. You know, they need the support more than anything else. And Penn State, I mean, for God's sakes, I mean, you're a Penn State fan. Stay for the whole game. You, know, you can go to tailgate after, but stay for the game. All right, time now for our picks. We start out with Florida and Florida State. Jay, you have that one. Florida playing great defense, but I think Florida State has a few too many offensive weapons. The game's in, Tus in uh, Tallahassee. I'm going to take Florida State in this one. 
I have Colorado and Utah. It's great to see the two newest members of the Pac-12 doing so well so early. Colorado's at home. Like the quarterback matchup better for Colorado. I go with the Buffaloes in that one. Oh, and in the cruel joke of the week, Auburn, Alabama's Trey. <laughs> okay, so, okay. <laughs> There's no professional franchise in Alabama. So Alabama, you know, Auburn is the big deal for the entire state. Um, the fact is, Auburn doesn't have Scam Newton, right? <laughs> Alabama is Alabama, and they're playing Alabama. I think that Alabama really takes it to them, and I think it's not even going to be close. Scam Newton. That's, Scam Newton. That's good stuff. All right, I have the game, number two at number three, or number three at number two. I'm not sure. Whatever. They're two and three, Michigan and Ohio State, and I think the Wolverines have like 80 seniors. I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> but Ohio State has JT Barrett, and Michigan's bringing a backup quarterback to Columbus in the horseshoe. If you can't win this one and you're the Buckeyes, well, they've won 13 out of the last 15. I think they're going to make it 14 out of 16 in the series. Senior day for the Nittany Lion football team. James Franklin says a special group. You know, I, I, think, I think they're going to be remembered as, as the class that, that really kind of held this place together and also, um, you know, left, left, left out of here by, you know, making sure the program was, was headed in the right direction before they, they walked out the door. So uh, very, very proud of those guys and very, very appreciative as well. I think that says it all speaks volumes. All right, keys to the game. We'll go with you, Trey. I think the keys to the game are actually it's, it's before the game. I mean, all the nonsense, all the talk about, well, if Penn State wins and Ohio State wins and Penn State's in the Big Ten championship game, I mean, to me it's like the kids have got to kind of focus, not be distracted by all the nonsense. The key to the game to me is for them to block it all out. Okay, play with the lead is what I say. Absolutely. Take them out of the game emotionally, ASAP. They probably will OD on tryptophan and turkey. They're already punch drunk. Finish them off early. All right. Hope you enjoy it.